All right, what will we watch tonight? Hmm, the G word with Adam Conover. I heard Adam ruins everything was all right. I heard Adam's a, a good egg, that might be all right. Got good recommendation for the dropout folks, that might as well be it. A comedy show about the United States government starring me, produced by you. Huh. And on its best days, our government is a tool that we can use together to build that better world for ourselves and each other. I have concerns. What the fuck was that? What was it? What was it? Just what? There was just swell guys. Why is Obama producing this show? Government what is it? versus small government? Just swell guy after swell that guy. Is insane to me that there is nobody. What is going on with the GPS section? Why? Why is no one freaking I'm out about that? Freaking out of my head right now because this is one of the strangest things I've seen in a while, and I don't, I don't quite know how to make of it. Fucking swell. <laughs> Why are there so many swell guys? Okay, got that out of my system. Uh, this is a bad show. I think this is a bad show. It's a bad show and as much as I, I want to and could, uh, and I could do this, spend 40 minutes in the sort of free form ranting at camera about the various bits and pieces that annoy me like a sort of free flow pissed off jazz piece i could do this but instead i'm going to try and force something productive out of this something that's worth talking about first i'm going to pick out some themes which are uh, immediately apparent to me in the show some things that immediately jump out to me as a uh, well problematic you know, its relationship to propaganda, the proposed solutions to its pro political problems, and murderous imperialism. Next, we're going to look at the show as a whole through the lens of some Marxist theories of the state. Because although Adam talks about the G word in this show, what he's really talking about is the capitalist state. And you know I'm not going to let you get away with coming to a video of mine without any theory. Come on you nerds, get a grip. So this show is, in my view, liberal propaganda. And we can't talk about the show with any honesty without first talking about the fact that it's produced by my friend and yours, Barack Hussein Obama. And Adam clearly agrees with me here because this is how the show begins. Him and Obama mulling it out as old pals. So in the opening skit, which starts with Obama having trouble with his taxes, silly goose. You're producing the show. People are going to think it's pro-government propaganda. But our friend Obama, he, he disagrees. This show's not about pro-government, big government propaganda. It's about showing what the government does in a balanced way. He won't tell Adam what to write. He can talk about whatever he wants. Make the show you want to make. I've got expenses to report. And now the astute amongst you, which I'm sure as all of you, because if you're here, you're astute. Look at y'all there. You wee astute wee things. If you're astute, you'll notice a small detail that people telling you what to write and, and having total one person with total editorial control over what you write, that's not how propaganda works. At all. Not in capitalism anyway, not in modern capitalism, not in journalism, and not in this show. Like. Not to drag Chomsky in here too early, but one of the key features of manufacturing consent is that journalists mostly aren't told what to write. They have their jobs because what they write is consistent with the economic and ideological needs of the corporation and the, and the state, of course. And I'm not saying that Adam is necessarily a journalist here, but his reasoning is exactly in line with the reasoning that journalists who are accused of producing propaganda take. So take a look at this 
classic Chomsky clip. How, how, can you, how can you know that I'm self-censoring? How can you I know that you're self-censoring? Are... I'm sure you believe everything you're saying. But what I'm saying is if you believe something different, you wouldn't be sitting where you're sitting. Mmm, some tasty classic Chomsky. And so it is with Adam here. The fact that Obama is producing the show doesn't necessarily mean that Adam's being told what to write, and I fully believe that he wasn't being told what to write. Um, but it does mean that what's written is in no way going to challenge Obama's ideological or economic interests, which, after all, are the ideological and economic interests of the state. He was the fucking president. Come on! <laughs> like, this is, this is, is this the sort of, like, level that we're working on? That, like, the president can be like, oh, you write whatever you want and, and we won't sort of be like, this is quite clearly bound to be propaganda. I, I'm becoming agitated. Okay, look, I'm as skeptical as you are. No, I don't believe that to be the case, Adam. Actually, you know what, let's just ask him. I guess a good place to just start is, is at the beginning of the show. Because um, I think there's something that I noticed and something that seems to be at the forefront of the show is the worry that the show is in some sense propaganda. Because you mm -hmm. talk about that over with, with, with producer of the show, Barack Obama and yeah. uh, and like well is this is this propaganda and Obama says to you in the show you can talk about whatever you wanted um mm -hmm. and I just wanted to talk what how how did you think that that sort of influence or did you think that that sort of influenced the construction of your show because I, I will talk about a bit about propaganda in a second uh, absolutely it, it influenced the the production of the show I mean it's it's woven into the fabric of it and that scene you know, I wrote and shot with the former president in order to try to, first of all, be transparent with the audience about the conditions under which the show were produced and try to be transparent about the the area that we tried to carve out for ourselves, you know, the, the area of inquiry and like space that we have. So, uh, look, the the foundation of the show is clearly compromised, right? I knew that it was going in. Um, it's like... It, it's part of the conditions that are unfortunately as someone working in mass entertainment i don't have the luxury of making a piece of uncompromised content and i would argue almost nobody does you know all i can do is a try to carve out space of editorial independence for myself where i get to say everything that i want to say to the extent that i can um and two i try to be transparent about it with the audience we, you know, i felt that there's a conflict at the core of it but that i needed to approach it in much the same way to um, try to be clear about it with the audience, to try to make sure that I can go to bed at night not feeling that the show has been unduly influenced. And by trying to pick fights that will uh, do my best to disrupt that influence, right? Not to play nice with it, but to try to like, you know, pick some fights in which I'm gonna go to the mattresses really hard in order to grapple with it. Ow, that's my foot, you wanker. The cat is deciding to grab my foot with his claws at this moment because he's a dick. It is interesting to me that Adam accepts that the foundations of the show are compromised, but I don't think that that really makes it defensible to know that the foundations of the show are compromised. Like, you can always just not make something if you know it's compromised. And I think this sort of, we'll return to this because I think it gets into his theory of well, how action happens as well, um, and, and how how he interacts with with propaganda. But we 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 may return to that later on. I can't remember because I'm reading the script right now, and I can't remember what I've written yet. We'll see. And um, by the way, that full interview is gonna is online right now for patrons, and will be available for everyone else in a couple of weeks. So the other thing that this first interaction with Obama sets up in the show is that it seems to be a vehicle for showing off an array of just just swell guys, just the swellest guys, just a bunch of swell guys in governments doing their swell guy stuff and, and being swell along the way. Government, that's just a bunch of swell guys doing swell guy stuff and doing their best to be swell. Uh, and Obama is the first and maybe the swellest of them all. But you see these swell guys in the abattoir. The reason I do this is because I'm interested in public health. These are just some of the cows that are going to slaughter today. Oh, this is horrifying. 
to the swell guys in the FDIC, to the swell guys in the Air Force. This cat man. Ah, oh, fuck me. Jesus, puss. Why are you doing this? Fucking filming in the living room. Wanker. And we'll return to the swell guys in the military in a moment. Don't you dare fucking get, get on that place. Don't you dare. Don't you dare. Don't you fucking dare. And we'll return to the swell guys in the military in, in a brief moment. And the purpose of all these swell guys is to me so deeply ideological. Like the, the argument is made that it's about showing the people in government and what they do and where, how they work and if they work to help you or hurt you in certain ways. And no matter what you think of the meat industry, I think you have to be happy that at every meat factory in America, there are inspectors on the line who work not for the company, but for us with our best interest at heart. But they don't work for us, do they? They work for the state. And this idea that they work for us is hugely, hugely ideological. And you can make the argument that they should work for us, but that's, again, hugely ideological. And that sort of working for us, the, na the idea that the, the state works for us, is something we'll get into deeper later, but is something that permeates throughout the whole show. And what these swell guys end up really doing is obscuring the nature of the capitalist state and forcing us into viewing structures of, of the state as being determined by good or bad human activity within it. It's abstracted away from the real issues. And interviewing this guy from the US FDA really shows us this, the problem with this show. Because this human element serves to obscure like what is happening. And like you talk to a guy who's being like, oh, I have a sense of duty, a sense of care for for everyone in the country, or the vet for what is an immense and utterly disgusting slaughterhouse, and you focus on them seeming swell or or caring about us and their job being there to care about us, to work for us, and suddenly the immense and environmentally destructive, morally catastrophic slaughterhouse seems a little bit less bad. It seems like, oh, there's maybe something there to make sure it's not really that bad. And to be fair, Adam does say that the meat industry is environmentally terrible and that the cows don't look happy with it. And, you know, he told me himself that he personally found that a very disturbing experience. Look, I'm someone who thinks that factory farming is, is a cruel abomination, right? Mm. That should be ended. But with the humanization, the social forces at work which perpetuate this whole thing, which are producing this horror, are somewhat muted and instead we're invited to think, oh, well, they seem really swell really and it's, it's good that they've got people working for us who care about us from the state there to, uh, to look after us. It's good that they care about us, which is, which is again, a deeply and hugely ideological thing to be invited to think. But we also start, as Adam does throughout, asking humanizing questions of the state. Does the state care about us? Is this, isn't the state supposed to protect us? Does the government care about our health? Are inspectors on the line who work not for the company, but for us with our best interest at heart? So maybe the government does care about our health? Americans are being hurt or killed by the same criminal justice system that's supposed to be protecting us. It was kind of the same way. How can it care for us if we don't care for it? And the very worst example of these swell guys and the sort of questions that they invite us to ask isn't actually Obama, although that is less than ideal. But it's when Adam goes to the US military base uh, and talks to the military personnel who run GPS satellites which gets us to... So in episode four, Adam uh, begins with a history of GPS, highlighting how while the technology emerged uh, from the Cold War, it's now a massive public good that was funded by the state and upon which trillions of dollars of industry rest. GPS has generated over $1.4 trillion for American businesses. And we will return to this, this, this notion of the state entwinement with the economy later on because it's again another very important ideological question that's kind of smuggled in there. But for now what's important is that Adam lays out just how 
deeply essential GPS is to the functioning of society. How it's a global good upon which we're all massively dependent in our everyday lives. And not just those in America, but those across the world. I mean, this amazing utility that has transformed our lives only cost the DOD two tenths of a percent of its yearly budget to maintain. Even a minor glitch wouldn't just send me back to MapQuest printouts. It could seriously disrupt our entire society. And with that benevolent glow, we go to meet the US Army personnel who control it. So who's in charge of making sure this vital system stays on course? Hey, Adam. Oh, hi. Where we send the commands, how we command these satellites, that's where I'm showing you. That is so cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My God, this is horrible. This is bone chilling. This is blood curdling, right? This is deeply, deeply disturbing stuff that the US military, 10 people, these 10 people control the, the fucking, the, this essential service for the world. These 10 people in the US military. Like these, this isn't cute. This isn't, this isn't a cute thing. This is bone chillingly terrifying. Not just that the US does it, but it's the US army. How old are you? 20 years old. Okay. The guy being 20 is, is not the issue here. The issue is that, according to this show, these 10 people in the US military control the essential functionings for the daily lives of billions of people worldwide. That is an immense and bone-chilling degree of power for the US, the global hegemon, to, to hold. Like, that's an immense and terrifying amount of power, right? But this whole... This whole section is just framed in very, like a cutesy, like a curiosity, almost, this, this whole section. To be fair to Adam, he does ask the question, kind of. I wouldn't have been surprised, oh, the government's in charge of it, but I would have thought, ah, NASA, NOAA, one of those other agencies. Why the military for GPS? Uh, but notice how it's still, like he questions that it's the US military that has this power, not the US itself. The US itself having this power isn't, isn't in question, it's just which part of the US state is responsible. But what I think worse is how this... So really the entire world gets to benefit from these 10 operators that are doing yeah. this mission on a daily basis, and so it's an added benefit for the, the entire globe. That gets left unquestioned. Yes, let, let us lowly citizens of the world bow down before the benevolence of the US military, before the benevolence of the US state. Find me a boot for it must be licked. I'm not. I'm not gonna lick this. I'm not gonna lick the boot. So when I asked Adam about this, he said he wanted people to be chilled by it. While, you know, he did say that he thought that another US, uh, US government agency should still be in control, he wanted people to be chilled by it and he wanted to be able to contrast this more light-hearted tone with the more dark tone of the following section, which we'll get to in a second. But, you know, just get, coming back to the GPS thing, I'm glad that you were chilled by the segment in the GPS uh, in there. I was also a little chilled being in there. That's kind of the fucking point, was to present that contrast between those things that the, that the military does. But I find that I find the justification quite un unconvincing, to be honest, because given the structure of the episodes and all the episodes really, what what happens is you have like the government does a good thing uh, versus the government does a bad thing or does a bad thing but also does a good thing, and that combined with the sort of cutesy and curiosity tone doesn't, in my view, convey the horror of this situation. Like if I was doing it, like I am now, I would just say. This is horrifying that these 10 people control it. Uh, that it's not an international good, but that it's confined within the, con within the US state. I, I, find that, I find it quite, quite difficult watch that. Uh, quite a difficult watch. Around this time I also asked like, wh how would this play to people in America? And brought up that a huge part of American culture is support for the troops. Uh, even in left-wing spaces, and I'm, I mean, it's not ubiquitous, but still. And I find it hard to believe that within the cultural context of America, that this doesn't play as just like a cutesy curiosity. Um, but even if not, you know, the US having control of it that isn't in the military is still, to be clear, fucking terrifying.
But this is a very good example here of how the swell guy effect works to obscure the brutal realities of the US state. How could these 10 people be agents of brutal imperialism when they seem like, you know, such swell folk, such nice folk? But it's not the only example of imperialism and the blood-soaked nature of the USA being somewhat obscured in this show. Later in the same episode, after musing over why so many technological advancements have been made through warfare, Adam's walking through a park and laments that the drones also make people nervous because while they've gotten us some beautiful wedding shots, it's not the only kind of shot they take. So I literally don't have time here to unpack the levels of ideology at play in this segment which is explaining the usefulness of military drones for keeping American soldiers out of combat. I'd obviously prefer this robo-plane to get shot at than my neighbor's kid. But I do have time to unpack this comment. But what are the unintended consequences of an invention like this? After this, Adam explains how drone use has rocketed in recent years, how the Obama administration used them to assassinate and surveil people from across the globe in, country, in you know, countries that the US isn't really at war at, and conspicuously explains this in a wedding venue. Of course, Obama is famous for murdering many innocent people in uh, weddings, at weddings via drone strike. And this could be an excellent opportunity to get there and examine the sort of murderous, blood-soaked, imperious role that the US state fills within global capitalism. Instead, Adam puts down the use of drones to enact global violence to the... But what are the unintended consequences of an invention like this? The unintended consequences of Reaper and Predator drones. The unintended consequences. None of this is unintended, obviously. Warfare like this is absolutely intended and it's consistent with the economic, political and ideological goals of the US state. Putting drone strikes down to some dehumanized technological influence, which is bizarrely separated from the state and the economy and ideology which creates and sustains them, is simply, in my view, outrageously defensive of the blood-soaked nature of the US state. It's maddening to me that we spend so much time in the show humanizing the state and the sort of swell guys who operate within it, but as soon as technology comes and the horror that that unleashed, we suddenly create this distance of unintended consequences. What kind of a future world is this technology creating? The problem is, is, is laid at the door of the technology and not necessarily the state and economic system which produces it. And I did put this to Adam. What we are trying to do is give a really bulletproof account, of, no pun intended, excuse me, uh, of what that technology did, right? The invention of the technology did. Um, and the very sort of like mainstream critique of drone strikes. And by the way, the reason it needed to be uh, bulletproof is because I'm making the fucking show with Barack Obama, right? And if I go out on a limb, um, I'm gonna have to have a lot of like, I'm gonna be on the defense. I'm gonna have to have a lot of conversations I don't wanna have, right? Um, but if I am really focusing on, hey, this is what like people who, who study the invention of this technology uh, have you know, determined about the effects of it, then I'm on really firm ground, right? Because I'm like, well, look, there's fucking studies that say this. I'm saying them on television. You don't have much to argue with. Um, so the, the point that we tried to make is that the invention of the technology created a moral hazard, right? Such that you can now order strikes that formerly you would have to have a pilot in a plane order the strike and you wouldn't want to send a plane over Syria or whatever because then the plane could get shot down. You might have to go like do a fucking Black Hawk down and rescue a pilot, right? And, and all this and it's bad press and et cetera. So the people who lead our military wouldn't want to do that. Um, when you uh, invent a technology that allows you to do it unmanned, it creates a moral hazard where it suddenly becomes much more tempting to order a lot more strikes. All these strikes you wanted to order before, you suddenly can uh, at very little cost to yourself. Because the drone gets shut down, who cares? It's a couple $10 million, you know, but it's it, it, it doesn't cause all these other problems. Um, and uh, I, I mean, again, th this is like, uh, you know, for us, that is the piece that, that is the point that we are able to make that is, basically incontrovertible and is rock solid. Now, what I feel that you probably would like me to do is to say US foreign policy is a policy of imperialism maintained through military hegemony and the wanton death of you know many, many people overseas and their killings. 
And I would agree with all of that, right? I, mm -hmm. I agree with that. I believe that that's the case. But that to me, like making a point about American foreign policy, American imperialism is more than I am able to do in a half hour episode of a show about the government, right? For me, I find the response a bit unconvincing. I think it is illustrative of the propaganda nature of the show that he felt that he couldn't talk about wider thing like imperialism, whether that's because, you know, he didn't think it was it would be entertaining, Netflix wouldn't pick it up, or he'd be on less firm ground with Obama. That is already uh, confining the, the, the argument within a very tight box. But also in saying that the technology creates a moral dilemma that you can now enact drone strikes seems to put a directionality in the wrong way where the technology is the determining factor of the violence and not the nature of the state, which again is hugely ideological. And I know Adam Adam says that he agrees that uh, the US is a hegemonic blood-soaked imperialist state, so I don't think he's trying to, to make that other point, but just within the confines of the show, the effect is that imperialism is obscured and the propaganda effect of the show is maintained. And I guess in the end, all of this leads us back to Obama. And I, I am sure Obama didn't tell Adam what to write here, except he does say that there's one joke that they wouldn't let him use. But if there's one thing that reflects well on Obama's legacy, it's excusing the, re the use of drones as an untended consequence of a moral hazard created by technology. You know, how could he resist this moral hazard? Rather than, you know, that he is a willing and very vocal proponent of US imperialism, an agent of it. And it's with Obama that we reach. So naturally, when you're trying to find solutions for the state of the state, the person that you'll obviously turn to is, I guess, the former president of that state, who is, of course, a swell fucking guy. Make some peanut butter sandwiches with, with him. I'm very particular about how you make a PB and J. Oh yeah, do you uh, still make your own sandwiches a lot? No. I don't much like watching war criminals pad about in their mansions making cute peanut butter and jam. Not a big fan of it, to be honest. Not a big fan. But Obama here is very quick to illustrate the exact ideological trick that the swell guy figure perpetuates. We have to remind ourselves that uh, it's a human institution, like every other one, which means there are going to be screw-ups. Which here serves to remind us that any solution has to centre some sort of flawed humanism as the cause of the problem, and not, you know, that the state is an expression of solidified ruling class settler colonial white supremacist interests. Our solutions can't draw on that because the state isn't is a human institution. We can't draw on the, this analysis because that analysis isn't given. Instead, it's centered wholly on the human element. And this is, I think, something that, that was missed in the interview, maybe I, which I maybe should have expressed clearer, is that the analysis of the state is important because it's where we draw our action from. The problems here is that people mess up, that there's some bad apples in there. There are going to be people who are doing things for the wrong reasons. And in fact, this entire interview with Obama seems to serve to undermine collective action in favour of some sort of funneling into a narrow electoral frame. Even when Adam puts up some opposition to what Obama's saying. People have been demanding change on for a really long time. Criminal justice, police violence, it's hard to take. The response from Obama is firstly this. The, the only thing we can't do is lapse into cynicism. Which frankly annoyed me given that this is perhaps the most cynical part of the show, which is illustrated by what he says next. And say, well, because this hasn't changed at the pace that it should, there's nothing we can do about it. Now I wonder why the great disappointment Barack Obama might have some concern about pushing back against cynicism for electoral change 
uh, or the mass disillusion which is drawn from mass disappointment from that lack of change. I wonder if he might have any vested interest there. And Obama then goes on to relay the importance of voting and participating even harder in the system. And when Adam again offers some challenge to this. We didn't see change despite that being in my lifetime, the biggest mass movement for change that we've that we've seen in the country. Right. Obama says this. Except it turns out Mitch McConnell was elected huh. precisely because the country is a big, diverse, complicated place. Really, if the country is just so big and diverse and the state is, as the show would have you believe, just a reflection of the, of the, of the people, of the collected mass of the people, then how can you really expect change to come? But there's something else going on here as well. The framing here seems to apply that Obama really wanted to do all of the things. He wanted to do the good stuff and was just held back from doing it by bad people in government. The reality is, however, that Obama is just a different expression of the same underlying neoliberal, not even liberal, fucking neoliberal ideology as Mitch McConnell. He wasn't stopped from enacting drone strikes or pushing through uh, chartered schooling, pushing tax cuts and austerity and uh, deregulation. He enthusiastically and vocally supported all of that. He had a fucking super majority in his first, first two years. He could have done anything, but he didn't. And in his 2013 State of the Union address, his ideology is on show. He goes on and talks about the unparalleled power of the free market to produce wealth and freedom and characterizes the role of government as the unfinished task of encouraging free enterprise and rewarding individual initiative. He is a neoliberal ghoul, <laughs> an expression of the same class interest. And then there's this bit where he justifies the state existing to maintain the status quo and says, Ah, uh, you know, make me you know, king for a day and I can just, you know, issue my edicts. Like your drone strikes, mate, eh? A situation where an all-powerful, all-knowing uh, individual or small set of individuals are able to make decisions for everybody. This bit is so cynical. It's so deeply cynical. Here we are in President Obama's massive fucking house lamenting that we don't want power to be held by a small set of individuals. Right? President Obama in your massive house? Like, I don't think I need to explain why that's jarring. They thrive in that kind of environment. And of course, this section comes to a close with the former president, Barack Obama, telling people to vote in local elections. This is a frame for the remainder of the episode, which essentially makes the argument that um, it's our responsibility to get more involved with local government. And it's here that I think the show moves from being frustrating to being quite harmful for left-wing movements. Rather than advocating for a generation of radical modes of social and community organization which resist the state oppression and build a uh, collective power and alternatives to state action in local communities or in, in different contexts the show or even in the workplace you know the show essentially argues for funneling that discontent into the constraining realm of electoral politics and to his credit adam talks about this uh, in the interview and saying that he he thinks that it, it was a fail, a missed opportunity to talk more about like labor organization and community organization outside the realm of electoralism. But in the confines of this show, the limits of this are shown quite clearly in this interview. And so that allows us to think about, okay, now what do we have to do on the congressional level, senatorial level? The focus presented by the show is on reaching higher levels of the state. Like I don't for a second doubt that these are good people who do good work and um, Adam talked to me about the, the movement itself, which is not some, I wasn't aware of who they were. Um, and they do work beyond electoralism, which, you know, is great. And obviously I support that. But as it's presented by the show, by people who might not know who they are, it just looks like it's focused on getting the good people into the state, not dismantling the state or taking economic power, or indeed notably, not with reference to the settler colonial nature of the state and the exclusion and elimination of indigenous peoples, which is central to the construction of a settler colony. At no point in this is worker organization mentioned either, which 
I think gets to an assumed distinction here between the state and the economy upon which the shows rest. And ultimately, despite the claims to grassroots organising, this argument isn't grassroots power. The people aren't getting power within what's being presented to us in this show. The collective power is being constrained within the confines of the capitalist state. And if this is something that groups are uh, very focused on in the US, then it's something I would have severe criticisms of those groups doing. We have to be extremely, extremely careful with our engagement with the state. Yeah, extremely careful. And yeah, this isn't, like I said, this is a critique that Adam is sensitive to, but I remain somewhat unconvinced by his argument because it's not really communicated in the show. And in some ways, like, profiling movement, which does have a focus on building power outside of the confines of the state and only focusing on its electoral politics is maybe, maybe worse, maybe just as bad, maybe worse. Like, it's open to the charge of co-option, right? You know, and I'm pretty sensitive to this right now because in work I've done in my area, we have the left-wing people in government. Um, we've got, like, the far left wing of the Labour Party in control of our local area. Um, and they were brought brought to power by a sweep of, of people doing work for them, organising around them. Uh, and what's happened is that we're just fighting them now. We're, we're just fighting the left-wing people now that they're in government. Like... Getting good people into the structures of the state isn't the route for change because despite the many, many invocations of the government as a being a reflection of all of us. Precisely because the country is a big, diverse, complicated place. And just like Soylent Green, it's made of people. People aren't perfect. So our government is far from perfect too. It's everything all at once because we the people are all those things too. The state is not a reflection of a collective us, but an expression of a specific class power. So this is the serious part of the video where we're no longer just wearing a Hawaiian shirt and dunking on TV show, I'm tricking you into learning about Gramsci. So enjoy, hence, you know, the, the, the serious clothes and the books, because that's how you know I'm being serious. So a lot of problems with this show can, I think, be traced in a significant way all the way back to its consistent lack of conceptualization of the capitalist state. What it is and what it does, which Adam fully admits to some degree, like he hasn't, he hasn't got a full conceptualization of the state except uh, that it's a human institution. You know, I, I guess, you know what, I, I, I misspoke because I do have an ideological or philosophical belief about what the state is to a certain extent, which is that I do believe that it is a reflection of humanity writ large. So here I'm going to do a quick dive into what the state is, into some theories of the state, drawing on Gramsci and a bit on Polansis, um, before showing how the G word actually seems to work to support the very sort of construction of the capitalist state itself. So to understand the capitalist state, we need to understand it as both an expression of capitalist social relations and as a means of solidifying and maintaining those social relations, which, and, and this has to be emphasized, isn't simply a tool that the bourgeois just picks up and uses, uh, which can therefore be readily picked up by us to use to overthrow the bourgeois, but is rather a class state in that it creates the conditions under which a certain class can fully develop. And I'll go over the implications of this in just one second. Much of the Marxist work on the state can be drawn back to Italian Marxist Antonio Gramsci. You know of uh, the old world is dying and the new world is struggling to be born. Mamma mia, fame him. In his prison notebooks, Gramsci argues that the state is seen as the organ of one particular group, destined to create favourable conditions for the latter's maximum expansion, but the development and expression of the particular group are conceived of and presented as being the motor force of universal expansion, of a development of all the national energies. In other words, the dominant group is coordinated concretely with general interests of the subordinate group and the life of the state is conceived of as a continuous process 
of formation and superseding of unstable equilibria between the interests of the fundamental group and those of the subordinate groups. Equilibria in which the interest of the dominant group prevail, but only up to a certain point, i.e. stopping short of narrowly corporate economic interests. Do we all get that? And so what that means is that the capitalist state is the crystallized expression of ruling class dominance. But that expression isn't totally static because it's destined to create the favorable conditions for the ruling class's maximum expansion. And, and so the state is constantly trying to mediate tensions and contradictions within society as a whole. It's like that Stuart Hall quote about hedge money being constantly shifting and reinforcing itself in different ways. It's not a static and settled thing, much like the state. So to take like a practical example of how this works, we can look at something like the institutionalization of black civil rights in the wake of the civil rights movement. Victories were undoubtedly won as a result of mass civil disobedience and concrete struggle in the street. And it is important to always foreground the role of this concrete struggle over something as like pacifism or, or anything, you know, more uh, acceptable to the liberal frame when it was riots and concrete struggle, which won these things. But as a material and institutional expression of hegemonic class interests, the state took those victories, expressed them as a development of all of the national energies, as a kind of like national moral development, and institutionalized these victories through mechanisms like legal rights, like codifying these legal rights, and in doing so folded them into the development of an officially colorblind racism, which uh, was a means of maintaining white supremacy and the capitalist state through things like you know, mass incarceration or the war on drugs or the massive expansion of police power, which is a topic which is dealt with, in my view, quite quite poorly by the show. And I, I know Adam disagrees to some extent on that. And you can imagine by contrast, if there was no institutional victory of the civil rights movement, as in one institutionalized through the state, that the threat to the state and, you know, by extension, the bourgeois as a whole, from an increasingly militant and powerful subaltern social movement would have been quite significant. But instead, the equilibria between subaltern classes, the oppressed groups, and the bourgeois was maintained. Capitalism and white supremacy were maintained. And for reasons like this, where the immediate class interests of segments of the white bourgeois, and indeed following from a sort of Du Boisian idea of the wages of whiteness, large segments of the white working class too, uh, are in conflict with the longer term conditions of uh, the expansion of the ruling classes as a whole. The state operates to smooth over these divisions within the ruling classes and within society as a whole and maintain those conditions. And it's for this reason that we don't say that the state is a ready-made tool to be picked up by whatever group happens to uh, become dominant, but rather that it is an expression of the crystallized class relations of society, the crystallization of ruling class interests. And essentially, the ruling class presents this maintenance of the bourgeois as the maintenance of all the people of the nation. Note that who is considered in the nation and of the nation is often quite uh, exclusionary, obviously. You know, racial minorities, migrants, indigenous people often obviously fall outside the bounds of who is included within the nation, who is included within the we that we're talking about within the state. We're constantly being asked to identify with the state as something which represents our interests or could represent our interests or should represent our interests as something that acts on our behalf or should act on our behalf. And that is as Adam says in his final piece to Kamina. It's everything all at once because we the people are all those things too. So what is the G word? This gin is still very strong. Is that the G word? Maybe. What is the G word? Throughout the show, we're invited to view the state in ways which are precisely consistent with the view of the capitalist state that I've just sketched out. Remember all the swell guys? It's made of people. People who wake up every day and go to work for no other reason than it's their job. And it's a job that needs doing. Well, not only do they obscure the functioning of the state through things like humanizing it, but they invite us to identify 
with the state. We're invited to see these people who work for the government and indeed we're invited to see the government as a whole as being just like us, as having our interests at heart, as being representative of us, as holding our interests as a people or as a nation at heart, even if it fails sometimes, fails a lot, or is corrupted by other interests. And this speaks to a larger problem too, because it's not just saying that the state cares about us. Frequently Adam asks, does the state care about us? Does the government care about our health? And sometimes problematically the answer is given is yes. There are inspectors on the line who work not for the company, but for us with our best interests at heart. But the issue is deeper than that. It's that even asking these questions, even in asking these types of questions, we're forced into conceiving ourselves as being part of the bourgeois nation, into identifying with it, and into flattening and obscuring the class disunities within the nation. And we're forced into this Gramscian frame here, right? Where the, the development and expansion of the particular group, the, the ruling classes, are conceived of and presented as the motor force of the universal expansion of the development of all national energies, of the nation as a whole. And a good example of this is when Adam does answer yes to the question, uh, does the government really care about us? And at least partly because of their efforts, over the last century, American life expectancy has increased by 30 goddamn years. <laughs> So this episode is about health and disease, and Adam finds that the state has pumped huge amounts of money into the health of the population. Turns out that our government's been using the one to fight the other. How could this not be a manifestation of our interests, we're invited to ask? Well, aside from surface level issues of state legitimacy, ensuring populations of workers can survive disease and live long, the health of the population is of interest to capital. Clearly, obviously, they need to be part of the social reproduction of labour power to maintain the development and expansion of the bourgeois. And it's presented by Adam as being the motor force of universal expansion of a development of all of the national energies. We're back at Gramsci every time. We can go, we can go, we can go further than Gramsci. We can go all the way back to the foundations. We can go to fucking Marx here. Because Marx tracked a similar trend in Capital Volume 1 as inspectors from the state tried to combat high factory mortality rates in England. Capital needs labor. <laughs> oh, it's a cat. Cat. He got on the. He got on the laptop. Sorry, the cat got on the laptop. Go to sleep, boy. Go to sleep. Sorry, I used you as a prop. Capital needs labor. The state doesn't care about our health as people, but facilitates the reproduction of our labour power for sale on the labour market. The G word obscures that. And in a similar way, the G word obscures the co-constitutive nature of the state and the economy and reinforces a very liberal and, in its increasingly sharp nature, neoliberal distinction between the state and the economy. Like, that's a, it's a classic thing. That, that distinction between the state and economy it is a mainstay of liberal philosophy. And we can see this if we take another example where the government seemingly cares about us. It's explained in the show that the Great Depression meant that there was a huge uh, public outcry as customers and bank customers' money was lost. And so FDR set up an insurance scheme to guarantee it. Adam then visits the sort of modern structure which, which does this, the FDIC, and at the end of the section comments that How incredible is this? Like, I don't know about you, I think this is one of the most effective government programs of all time. This is explicitly framed as the government protecting us, and effectively too. But really, if we examine it in line with my description of the state, it's quite clear how the state is just mediating the system which produces these boom-bust cycles in the first place, ensuring its survival ensuring the conditions for the reproduction and expansion of the bourgeois and mitigating any potential social unrest. Like, I'm sure fucking banks kick up a fuss about the insurance scheme because they're dicks, but that's why the state exists, to quell that fuss and to maintain the conditions for capitalism. And it is in this sense not a separate thing from another entity known as the economy, but a constitutive part of it. 
And we see loads of examples of this throughout the show, like in episode 3 when famous libertarian magicians Penn and Teller, that might be the most cursed sentence that's ever fallen out of my mouth. Libertarian magicians. Ugh. But Penn and Teller explain that. To save capitalism, the government needs to inject cash into the system to get the economy flowing again. Is this going to be explained? Is it going to be examined in this show? The relationship between the state and capitalism? Are we going to examine this? The Fed controlling the money supply? Are we going to question it? No. And it's also made quite clear in episode 4 on tech. Some of the most valuable companies in America were built on the back of a government utility that we, the public, paid to develop. <sighs> you know, maybe that means they shouldn't work so hard to get out of paying their taxes? Fetch me my guillotine. And when, so when we examine the functioning of the state properly, it becomes clear as day that it exists to do things like funnel massive amounts of resources into private capital. The state is of the economy, an expression of it and one of its supporting structures. But this isn't a leap that's made in the show. Instead, it seems to be couched in a confused milieu of, is big government good or bad? Government is practically a dirty word in America. I remember my mom telling me when I was a kid that the government was wasteful and that the private sector was much more efficient at getting things done. A perspective which finds support in the episode on disease which contains a couple of extended sequences about the reconstruction of the state under neoliberalism. And this is conceived of along neoliberal rhetorical lines itself as a weakening of the state or a shrinking of the state and in includes this bizarre imagery of a white muscular manifestation of the, the state helping black women out of poverty, which, yeah. But the point is, in these sections, the state is viewed of as getting smaller and less capable and weaker than, as, the, as the power of a separate entity called the free market grows. This philosophy that the free market should be trusted over the government to solve all our problems. A government that's weaker, less effective, less able to protect us. Despite its efforts to push back against this trend, even the Obama administration felt it necessary to compromise with the market. Despite its efforts to fight back? Even the Obama administration? This is doing the work of liberalism and to some extent neoliberalism for it. The strength and power of the neoliberal state to support the bourgeois is obscured and the state and economy are constructed separately. The G word reveals itself here to be at best confused and at worst actively being propaganda. And in our conversation, Adam, Adam points out that the line, even the Obama administration, is supposed to be read that like most people view the Obama administration as being um, not neoliberal, not like um, Bush and Clinton and, uh, and Reagan, and that Obama himself actually contests that view. But I find that not a particularly convincing argument, particularly given the line previous, which is despite its best efforts, the Obama administration uh, had to uh, had to negotiate with market forces. I, I find it hard to, to, <laughs> to square that circle there. But also, and if we remember the interview with Obama earlier, he points out and argues himself, largely unchallenged, that the reason he didn't get more done was because people like Mitch McConnell were, were in government. So I, I, I find that that's the perspective Adam has of that. I find it somewhat unconvincing. But th this slight neoliberal edge reveals itself again when Adam asks us, How can it care for us if we don't care for it? If it's our responsibility to make sure that our state is healthy and functioning properly, we are being responsibilized here for the conditions of our own immiseration. And again, it invites us to identify with this thing which doesn't represent our interests. It invites us to see ourselves as part of it, which of course we're, we're not really. And this responsibility to engage with the state also of course plays into the proposed solutions offered. So if our understanding of the goals of the capitalist state 
to subsume and funnel any popular movement into a means of maintaining the conditions for bourgeois expansion and the legitimacy of the bourgeois state, we can see how the proposed solutions in the G word aren't just inadequate, but actively facilitating that goal. I mean, a strong piece of evidence for that is that Obama suggested it, but we can work it through logically too. The proposed solutions are, like I said earlier, and I know Adam disagrees with me here, not facilitating a mass movement to grab economic and social power and build structures against the states to build their own alternatives to it, but a limited call to get the good people into government. And in light of our understanding of the state as a mediator of social divisions to maintain the conditions for the expansion of the ruling class, we can understand just how limited and limiting these solutions are. We need to build power from the grassroots via our communities, via our labour unions, via the realm of social reproduction to hark on one of my particular things, not funnel it away via the electoral realm and the state. So I really don't think there's any other word for the, the G word, except that it's liberal propaganda, which functions to mystify and obscure the real class nature of the capitalist state, which argues to funnel discontent into an acceptable mode for capital. And I think that this show could maybe be seen as being as kind of kneecapping as some forms of more right-wing propaganda, because it presents itself as having some degree of balance between, you know, the state does good things but also does bad things. But ultimately it's just getting us to support the state, support the status quo, just getting us to appreciate and engage with it more. The times when the state is criticised or confused or obscured with no real logic behind the problems revealed and we are constantly asked to confront the mysti these mystifying notions. It was interesting in the interview because Adam seemed to see both his role as like getting this position of power to make this show in parallel to the sort of politics of getting into power within the state to move things and nudge things in the right direction. But I wonder if that reveals a kind of underlying problem with the politics of both. That in both cases, the good intentions going in are constrained to do something which ultimately supports the liberal capitalist status quo. Like the state doesn't care about us as people and it doesn't do good things for an us which exists. And we can't just pick it up as a ready-made tool for liberation. This is true for all of us, but particularly so for racialized and indigenous people, obviously. I don't want to talk for indigenous people here, but I'm fairly certain there's a common critique of the settler colonial state in there. So I guess all I can say is if you decide to watch it, watch it with a deeply critical eye. Um, but I'm you're never not going to feel that way. You're trying to get people uh, in so that they get to my channel and go, wait, I find this Adam show really, <laughs> really frustrating now. <laughs> Alright, we're going to blast through this really quickly because we're going to need to get this, keep this fucking video under an hour. So, first things first, sign, sign up to Patreon. Fucking, there's, there's a PayPal link as well if you if you want to do that. One of them, it's also a Kofi thing. Anyway, next you can also get some cheap books using the, the discount code DUNCAN50 from Pluto Press. Links also in the description of the video. Nice. Finally, let's get some um, let's get some patron names read out. Niels Abelgard, Anita Inisby, Dan Wheatley, Dying of Thirst, Elisren, Kim Crawley, Aga Ghost. Austin Talman, Dan Daniel Hughes, Kieran Gore, Paul Singleton, Rachel Mixon, Rich, Robin, Shingo, Tamish Kismeter, Tinfoil Pancakes, fucking, there we go, and finally, thanks to Adam for doing, um, for, for talking to me, uh, it was a good conversation, seems like a sound guy, and I hope this wasn't too mean. You've had a lot of fun with the idea that I struggled to do my taxes, but that was just acting. I'm incandescent with rage. Fuck me.